everyone, welcome back to my channel. My name is Paola and today I am here with the amazing Connor who is doing an interview with me. So Connor, please introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about what your book is about. My name is Connor. I'm a quadruplet. I'm mentally disabled uh, and I wrote uh, The Sword in the Street, which is sort of like a Dickensian high fantasy that's about uh, an impoverished swordsman named uh, John Chronicle and his disabled boyfriend Edwin and their attempts to sort of escape poverty by participating in uh, a dueling system where the rich just sort of hire swordsmen to fight battles for them that will settle matters that are like just for both personal honor and actual just sort of corporate legislation. And um, while John is doing this, Edwin is discovering this sort of magic that's almost fueled by philosophy. Along the way, they both realize they have different lengths they're willing to go to to escape poverty. And a lot of the plot is around navigating that impasse and the way that that, that navigation sort of affects everyone around them. That is so much. Like the, the concept is just so high stakes. And I love that. That's how I love my fantasies. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so what inspired you yeah. to write this story? There were a ton of inspirations that sort of went into this. I don't even know if I could list them all, but um, two main things sort of compounded this, uh, sort of compounded and created the book. And the first was uh, at the time where when I began, I've been having a lot of thoughts about my place in various systems in the world, like um, for example, like I'm a white man who's also disabled and part Ashkenazi and like that puts me in like a weird place structurally where I often find myself on a systemic level feeling like a bit of a paradox. I've got one foot in a lot of camp in like a lot of camps. And so the writing of the sword in the street was an attempt to sort of navigate this sort of structural liminality that I kind of seem to exist in. Uh, and the other thing, um, probably the most glaring influence is um, anyone who's familiar with Ellen Kushner's Swords Point is probably going to know that this is like almost exactly the same setup as her books um, with the sense of like a, a dueling system uh, where the rich hire, hire uh, less fortunate people to duel for them and everything. Uh, and my book definitely shares a lot of intertextuality with hers. That's probably because I stumbled onto it in a library around 2019, read the back cover copy, I realized I could use that setup as a framework to explore the ideas I'd been having. Um, and like, I was like, well, I wanted to discuss this for a while anyway. And this sort of, this book or this set, setup um, gives me a good way to explore it. And so I, I, I didn't read the book until after it was out for that exact reason. I don't want like, I'm like, I'm already still in the setup. Let's make sure I'm not taking too much. That's fascinating. I love that. Uh, so what were some of the themes that you knew you wanted to explore since the beginning? There were a ton. I'm trying to narrow it down to um, like a small bouquet of themes. Um, I wanted to explore like the way poverty and masculinity and violence have this ability to intersect and the way that systems can sort of um, inform the way people act. Um, and branching off that was sort of a uh, I'm always fascinated with the way people can convince themselves that their worst behaviors are acceptable uh, and how closely you can cling to your own self-image when that's all you have. Um, I think that aspect of things tends to sort of express itself through the way that um, John and Edwin sort of struggle at maintaining healthy relationships since neither of them really have a positive model that they can work off of. Um, but the biggest thing I think that sort of twines through all the other themes I think I touched on it a little bit in the last question, but um, for a while now, I've just been obsessed with the idea of like liminality and just sort of being between two places. Um, and I sort of tried to drill that motif down into every aspect of the book. I wanted every major character existing in like this liminal space, like structurally, systemically, morally, and even physically. That's why you've got like so many scenes of people just walking around or just like, I'm concentrating a lot on the daily mundanity of preparation and change. That is so interesting. I love I, I love how insightful everything is and how intentional you you made everything. That's amazing. I love that. Um, Thank you. What was your favorite part about the uh, writing process? It was probably the uh, third or fourth draft for me. 
because um, I tend to underwrite my books at first. Like I'll have like a 30,000 word outline and then I'll finish the outline and I'll get to like, it'll be like 50 or 60,000 words. And, and then it's like, it's just a pile of like trash and memes at first. Um, and so that, so I don't have to take it seriously so I can just get through it. And then um, the second draft is just tidying it up. And it's probably the point that's the hardest third or fourth draft it's like I've got a decent sense of where I'm at at that point and I can get like the narrative congeals I don't know if that's the right word to use but just sort of various storytelling and thematic threads are like intertwined and, re and reinforced that's the point in which like this sort of amorphous and undefined sort of mass of a narrative that I've been making so far tends to like solidify into something with like a solid build and a structured shape and weirdly enough, despite congealing, it often gets longer. That's one of my favorite things to learn about uh, authors, how they go about like their drafts and the, what the writing process looks like for them. That's amazing. What would you say is your book's theme song? This one I actually struggled with the most um, to try and think of because a couple of times while actually writing it, um, do you know the Mountain Goats, the band? It's run by just this one guy, John Darnielle, and he has like, a ton, just a ton of music. Um, and there's one song called Up the Wolves, which is basically about frustration with the system when you're in a shitty place. And a couple of times during writing it, I would listen to that and just sort of explicate the lyrics if I needed to get into the right headspace. But I don't know if it fits as a theme song. And so um, after I was thinking about it, um, and I think a better sort of theme song would also be like a mountain goat song, which is called Cry for Judas, um, which sort of really sort of felt like it reflected the feeling of riding like the ragged edge of where you are now and complete disaster and the difficulty in determining like how you behave in that sort of situation. There's even this sort of duality between like the manically uh, psychotically upbeat sound of the song and then when it's contrasted with like the very dark lyrics that are happening um, which sort of I think pairs well with the liminality I was going for and the song itself also has a lot where like he packs a lot of intent and meaning into very small amounts of space. Each line is doing like at least three things at once, um, which very much I got into the band around the same time I started writing the book. And I think it influenced the way I went about writing it a lot. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, that I've also gotten that answer that sometimes it's one to get into the like the headspace to write. And then the other one is like that fits the characters and the story. And I love that, that's great. So what's something that you would like readers to take away from the sword industry? I struggle with that one because I'm very hesitant to say too much here because I was very intentional about the way I was trying to go about this thing uh, where I'm dealing with a lot of issues that don't have an easy answer and are very much your, your feelings about the characters are going to change depending on what experiences you've had coming to the book. When people were beta reading for this book, I didn't have two readers who felt the same way about the main characters. Um, so I hesitate to tell people like how, how to feel because nine times out of 10, like I don't think there's a right answer. But like if I had to think of one thing that I felt could apply to everyone, um, I think it would be like, I want people to walk away from this realizing the way just that structures and systems drive the behaviors of individuals even if you can't always see it it that kind of now that i think about it, that kind of twines into the idea of the song cry for judas where it's sort of it's sort of like judas in a sense i don't know like the idea that there are systems and structures that you a lot of people can't conceive of that drive the way individuals act i guess i could sum it up by quoting an offhand line in the book that a lot of other people have also said which is basically that like Hatred is a failure of imagination. Oh, I love that. That's very like poetic, but poignant. I don't, that's, I love that. Is there anything else you'd like to plug? Any upcoming books you're having? Or where can people find you? I'm on Twitter a lot at uh, the, at, at the CM Kaplan. I'm just now getting into into Instagram. So um, if anyone has anyone for me to follow, that'd be great. I am working on follow-up that's technically a sequel, but isn't isn't a direct sequel. It's sort of like Discworld in the sense that not one does not necessarily follow the other, 
and it's about a side character that was in this book and so it, and it overlaps with the last week of the events at the end of this book. This book you can find on Amazon or rated on Goodreads and yeah that's pretty much everything I can think about. I will leave the links to Connor's things down below as well as the uh, link so that you can add the book on Goodreads and uh, buy it on Amazon. Uh, thank you so much Connor for joining me and thank you everyone else for watching. Um, we will see you soon. Bye.